Hi everyone and welcome back to TESS. Um, we have uh, the one of the fireside chats coming up right now and I'm very pleased to have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Ivan Joseph. He is the current and outgoing Vice Provo of Student Affairs at Dalhousie University in Halifax and is about to start as Vice President of Student Affairs at Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, some of you may know Ivan. He is an award-winning coach, leader, educator, and author. He recently had a TED Talk called The Skill of Confidence that just hit 20 million views and has spoken to more than 750 audiences. Um, Ivan is also the author of a, uh, a leading book called You Got This, Mastering the Skill of Self-Confidence. Ivan, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Daniel. Appreciate it. It's a busy time for you, Ivan. Uh, you're just uh, about to leave uh, my alma mater, Dalhousie University in Halifax, and you're heading to Wilfrid Laurier University. Welcome back to Southern Ontario. It's good to be back home. It's closer to family, and I'm looking forward to working at a great institution that's known for their um, reputation on student experience. How has COVID been uh, for you and, and your family? I, I'm sure that this big move that you're about to undertake is completely different than uh, you would have imagined uh, had it been at another time. Oh, for sure. Even before the move, you know, my son was um, back in Ontario for a senior year of high school trying to um, take a few different classes so he could go to engineering. Um, that There's a different um, academic system in Halifax. And so my wife and my son were living in Ontario for the year and we were going back and forth. And as you try and put your family together, I spent over eight weeks from May until now. So basically two months in isolation, just in, in just the best part of the year. And when you're locked in a house, it's a pain in the butt. And then trying to navigate, um, you know, an application process, an interview process, a move, a housing relocation, uh, you, you know, this whole world is different. I mean, Again, my problems are not as big as everybody else's, but it's been a challenge, we'll say that. So different universities, similar roles, and different parts of the country. Um, what's going to change between Dalhousie and Wilfrid Laurier? Um, I'll say this, you know, at, at, at um, Dalhousie, I was a vice provost, and that means the provostial model. Um, this, I, I reported into the vice provost, and so... Well, I sat around with the Dean's Council, the Vice Provost Equity, the planning. Here at Laurier, I sit at the Vice President level, and that means I report directly to the President. And this is an important distinction because now you're on the senior most upper cabinet. Before I was in the probably the top 25, 30, maybe 50 leaders of the university. Now I'm in the like that last group, that, that group of seven that really has the President's ear and is really able to have the conversation about how to best impact student experience. My portfolio went from being in charge of 200 students and a $20 million budget to being, or 200 employees, not students, to being in charge of about 400 uh, full-time employees and a $64 million budget. Um, I really like the way Laurier has their um, student affairs portfolio aligned, where there's some dual reports and dual sharing with some of the um, provost team, as well as some of the VP finance and admin. And that's important because there's lots of those areas where we really touch um, with each other and there and there needs to be collaboration and I'm speaking about like the one card office the food service office the security office um, the center of learning and teaching in all of those areas there 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 is sometimes um, not just collaboration but a healthy tension ne needs to happen between the university trying to do the best for students and and meet their needs as well as sometimes think about revenue generation and and the financial health of a university and sometimes those those two things are, are, are positioned and juxtaposed against each other. So, so much has changed for so many people this year. Um, and, and when you look at the acceleration of digital learning that uh, we've all in the, in the education technology sector uh, have had to contend with, um, how has that impacted your students and, and actually you as well? Yeah, this is huge. Nobody saw... Um, like COVID coming and nobody thought about, well, you know, we're going to have to vacate the universities. And so what happened in the spring was there was this panic and mass exodus. We got to get these people out of here because university residences are like cruise ships. And if we get one person, this will spread like a wildfire and our campuses are not equipped 
to deal with this, we will have a serious issue. And so all universities across Canada um, scrambled to get their students online in a remote learning. And they were quick to make sure they discern the difference between online learning and remote learning. Because they had to do so in a quick pinch, they weren't best positioned. They were just like, how do we get people across the finish line? We're in the final 10 days of school here. Let's just do what we need to do to kind of maintain the academic integrity, be fair to our students and our faculty, and just like buy ourselves a little breathing room. In fact, so much so what happened is COVID created this digital evolution, as well as the suspension of many systems and processes that would typically take years to move through a faculty senate. I'll give you a perfect exam example, Daniel, is the grading scheme that typically needs to happen where the universities were able to retroactively say, you know what, we're going to change the way we assign grades. And the registrar's office, the Senate, the student governments came together and said, listen, this is unusual. These are unprecedented times. We should give students the opportunity to choose their grade. And many universities did that. Listen, we know that stuff halted. We know that things have changed. We know that you may not have access to a computer or internet. Let us work with you and help you get the grade that you think you deserve, that's fair to you. And these were, um, I think, really in the best interest of students. So that's just one example. Now we shift to the summertime where we're moving forward and we've got a lot longer and a lot better um, training and an opportunity to really think about what we want our university to look like what we want our class to look like, how are we gonna teach in this online platform that still maintains the rigor, the assessment processes, the experiential learning in some shape or form. And so we've had a lot longer to think about this and now we're best positioned to really deliver what I'll say the shift from remote learning where we were patching things together to more a, um, a, what I'll call online learning, which is a much more rigorous, comprehensive system of assessment. So is there a little less of a panic now among colleges and universities, do you think? You know, you're right. Uh, oftentimes it, it, it takes years for them to adopt major change. And here they've, they've had six months. Um, though to us, the six months really feels like, like a lifetime. It hasn't been that long. Um, are they addressing? You know what? I'll say this. I noticed that our university alone, like you're saying, well, how did the, you know, we put $3 million in scholarships. We put another $2 million in what we'll call academic preparation um, in order to help revamp our, CL, our center of learning and teaching, create different opportunities to teach our professors how to be actively engaged, to get our technologies up to speed, to make sure that what we could deliver was worthy of the Dalhousie reputation and name. And then we had to put together all these different systems online so that students knew how to navigate. How, what's Brightspace look like? How, what are we gonna do to create community? Community. What are we going to do to make sure that our students feel connected to the campus still? All of these things were happening and not one after the other. They were typically happening in parallel um, function overlapping. So um, there, there was chaos at the beginning of this of this pandemic. And, and I'll tell you now that we're kind of on the other side of that chaos, there's now fatigue where people have been going 100 miles an hour. They've been trying their best, um, no matter how old you are or where, if you're a first year or fourth year, your life has been impacted. Whether you're a new student, an emerging uh, professor or a veteran, um, your life is, is changed because of this pandemic. Well, I think that's a great segue into, into the next piece of, of, of this, and, and, and that is about talking about the conference and, and its theme, humanizing learning. Um, I'm very interested in the context of humanizing learning and, and how that has changed in the last year. What do you see as critical elements of uh, humanizing learning uh, today? How has it changed? Yeah, well, I'll say there's one thing is that we have to think about is that there's not one size fits all when we're thinking about learning. And I, for me, my definition about learning is how do we ensure that learning has happened? And that is, you know, do you see a change of behavior? And when you see a change of behavior, then you know that learning in some shape or form has happened and you've been able to do what you that you needed to do. And so how we need to recognize, especially during this pandemic, that everybody is reacting differently to it. And, and if they're reacting differently to it, then, then they will interact with the environment differently. Recognize that also we've got students that sometimes at home aren't in safe environments, who don't have access to technology, who don't have laptops or internet, who don't have their own rooms. And so all of these things are the types of accommodations that we need to think about 
when we're doing this learning? How do you give somebody extra time if their IEP, their individual education program says that's what they require? How are you making sure that a student has this, the ability to do the scribing or the note taking that they may need to do when they're now in this online learning environment? And these things, well, we don't have that. We don't think about it. Well, they're no longer in my classroom. And because the classroom is virtual, we're not thinking about this. The other day, I had a student who reached out to me because they don't have a safe place. They didn't have, they literally, the residence halls was their home. And they would go away in the summer and they would do a job that um, gave them a summer accommodation. Think about it, whether you worked at like a summer camp or you worked at um, a canoe place or you, you know, you maybe were planting trees that those summer jobs came with accommodations. And now all of a sudden the residence halls are closed. That student still has the money and still wants to be engaged and still wants to come to university. But now how do we accommodate their learning? And these are things that we're not thinking about in terms of humanizing the learning because we're like, well, that's not for us. And we're trying to treat everybody the same. Well, that's not their problem. That's not our problem. Um, we need to recognize that this pandemic is not just something that is, is treating everybody the same. It's the research tells us it's disproportionately impacting marginalized and underrepresented students. And if that's the case, then what are we doing as administrators to level the playing field so that we do not interrupt people's academic journey? And then that brings me to, to my next question. Um, and, and you've touched on this a little bit, which is great. Um, as technology continues to advance education, what are the challenges when it comes to inclusion? Uh, particularly from the lens of diversity and, and equity. Yeah, well, I can tell you what we're doing at Dow. Uh, clearly, we've invested additional dollars and resources into scholarships. We recognize that there's going to be a greater impact on student retention and persistence, especially in our underrepresented groups. There are summer jobs that have been limited. How many summer jobs were off the record? And some people got served and some people did not. And so we need to think about that. And so how did we, how did we address that? We beefed up our scholarships. What did we do for our international students, many who could not go home this summer? We needed to provide them opportunities to stay in the residence at a reduced cost. We needed to be able to still have access for our residents for those who were most, um, I'll say, displaced, our most vulnerable population. We needed to open up our residence halls for them to have access and the opportunity to still continue to study. And we needed to provide not just financial aid in the terms of scholarships and bursaries, but could we also provide it in the means of technological supports, technological grants in order to help them have access. And then in some shape, form or capacity, we needed to make sure our mental health and wellness um, services on campus were widely available, not just in person, but also virtually because people are located all over the globe right now studying. We needed to think about how we could still serve those students so that they could have access to the records, um, to the resources to help them navigate during these difficult times. And finally, last, I think we need to think as administrators all across this um, country about what are we doing to look beyond the nine to five, um, what I'll call typical systems. We operate as if universities that everybody moved to our town and we're going to deliver those services. Now we have to recognize that people are in China taking our class. People are in India taking our class. Heck, people are in British Columbia alone taking our class. And so how do we think about synchronous and asynchronous learning as well as extending our office hours to give people the opportunity perhaps to sometimes reach and be able to access our services during a time that's convenient for them? Inclusivity is that, making that, that intentional decision to make somebody feel welcome. And us shifting our hours is a perfect example of how we can do that. 2020 has been an unusual year in, in so many ways. Aside from COVID, um, we're seeing things happening in the U.S. with the presidential election that I don't think anybody expected. Um, and underscoring all of that um, would be the racial tensions in the U.S., um, that really uh, ignited this year with the death of, of George Floyd. I'm sure you know, and, and, and I certainly feel it myself, that um, things have been very different for, for Black people in North America. How do you think this affects students? And, and what do you think um, the steps are that post-secondary education should take to embrace inclusion, especially um, to support their black student population? I think this is a good question. You know, um, 
you know, it's diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not, it's, it's for students, but it's also for staff and faculty and all the people who make up a university's community. You, you know, I think you're, you, you saw first a groundswell of, of reaction and everybody went and put out their fancy statements and their black, blacked out profile photos. And I was like, what the heck? Okay. I get it. But like, as a black man, I was really ticked off a little bit, if I was to be honest with you, because I see those things as hollow statements. Um, those are things that are politically correct and nice marketing efforts. Um, I want universities to do more. And so what you've seen some universities do is, is start with the vice provost of um, equity and inclusion, um, leading forums, leading workshops, leading conversations and the dialogue and the discourse. You've seen faculty have these strikes that are raising the profile of this and say, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? I think these are important steps and conversations that we're having. But now we need to think about barriers, systemic barriers, access and pathways for our students. What different scholarships are we looking to recruit and help scaffold the supports for our underrepresented students? Is the Black Student Center up and running? Is the Indigenous Student Center up and running? Do we have it resourced appropriately? Do we have programming that's there to, to maintain the persistence and retention and the success of these students? What are we do, doing to think about the, the, the trauma that these students are experiencing during this community uprising right now? What about the faculty and the staff that we're bringing in? Are we, because if we bring in a bunch of black folks and there's no black uh, faculty or staff to mentor and support these students, what have we done? We've just created this big cycle where come on in, we'll give you, get you, we're going to give you a taste. And now you're going to fall through the cracks because we don't know how to support you. You know, I, the one thing I'll say is everybody's aware, but I'm not sure everybody's making actions. And what do I mean by that? Where are the hires? Where's the leadership development? Where's the racism training that's happening? Those are the things that we really need to think about that go beyond just us reacting and saying, oh my gosh, we got to change this. This is not good enough. I want action, not statements. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm 100% with you on that. Um, there was this emergence this year of organizations, and not just in North America, but all around the world, that thought it was perfect timing to profess that uh, they were inclusive and they were not they were not racist, and um, while I, the 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 idea of it uh, bears merit, um, I think certainly there is some frustration because the the whole idea of um, inclusion isn't just to say you're not racist. The whole thing is also to say what is it that you're doing? What steps are you putting in place? to demonstrate yourself as an equitable, inclusive, and accepting organization. So this is what something that has actually been, been on my mind for a long time, and I'm sure it has for, for, for many black leaders. And I recently read an article in the Globe and Mail that was titled, Hiring a Black Leader, Learn from My Experience and Treat It Like It Matters. And I'm smiling, Ivan, because you, as you know, you, you wrote that article. And what you presented were pillars that post-secondary institutions should put in place to support equitable hiring. And perhaps you can give us a, just a quick, just give a quick snapshot. And I'm going to make sure that, that, that we will share this, this article because it was really great. But give us a quick snapshot of what it was that the article said. You know, I wrote that article when I was really frustrated. It took me five versions to get to that tamer version. Um, and, you know, the next morning in my inbox, I woke up and there was about 350 emails from people across the country and in, into North America responding to that. Um, so, you know, that article was about what it felt like to be the designated hire um, and, and how it felt like to be marginalized and tokenized. Um, you know, I left my institution because, you know, you, you, when you're brought in with a mandate to help diversify and, and change, but you don't have the freedom and the autonomy to do your job. Um, then you start to recognize that this was an exercise on tokenism. I'm an athletic director and I came up through the athletic director rankings. And I'll tell you, I heard Congress many times I would go into meetings and people would already have the meeting before I got there. This is how we're going to handle Ivan. This is what we're going to do here. Um, I continuously felt, um, I'll say, um, marginalized. Um, I'll say put in my place whenever I came to challenge decisions, you know, 
I, I'll say universities look to bring sometimes in diversity and, and diversity means a differing opinion. And so when you bring that differing opinion, then you're also, always also can be labelized as lacking collegiality. And that was this thing that I heard time and time again. Well, you can't bring in diversity and a differing opinion and expect them never to voice that. That's not who I am as a leader. And I'll say this is that what, what happened um, was there was no formal mentorship program. And I won't say that, you, you know, I made some missteps. I need to own that. I didn't understand the politics. I was naive. Um, and I needed somebody to help navigate me through the systems of a, of a U15 university with its 200 year old history and tradition and where the power plays were and where the minefields were. And I stepped into them like a naive kid going out of, out of his house on the first day into the, into the big city. Um, but that would have helped me a lot. And then I also needed to be also recognized that, that there is a role to play um, and I needed to be a little bit more patient. And you, and you say that as a black man, like, well, we've been patient, we've been waiting long enough, but you can't change everything overnight. And so I don't want to just paint another university with a bad brush. That wasn't what this was about. The culture, you know, the university said they were ready, but the systemic culture proved otherwise. And we need to think about that. This wasn't about bad people. This was about a system that wasn't ready for the change that they were trying to promote. So really what you're saying is that even though organizations, colleges, universities, the private sector, even though they're saying that they're ready for diversity, they don't quite understand what that means. They see diversity as being welcoming by saying, sure, we'd love to have black people in our workforce. Sure, let's have some more women in leadership positions. Yes, of course, we would like to incorporate indigenous uh, peoples in, 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 our, in our workforce. What they're not actually understanding, though, is that true diversity also means reflecting, taking a look at your, or at the organization, take a look at how you work, look at the processes and the flows, and recognize that true diversity means that you have to make some adjustments. Where the system fails, I think, and, and I suspect that this is what you're saying, is that by bringing people on board and making people fit within the frameworks, the colonial frameworks, if you want to call it, that have existed for generations, that's where you have that disconnect. You really end up in a, in a situation of, of a square peg and, and a round hole. We want to keep what it is that we have. You can come, but you have to fit within that framework. And that's where things are failing. I, I'm not going to ask you who's who specifically is is doing it right, but um, a lot of organizations and a lot of post secondary institutions are doing their thing to try to embrace diversity and and be truly inclusive. Um, as you know, the keynote speaker for one of the keynotes for this event is Dr. Santa J. Ono, the president and vice chancellor um, at UBC. Um, we brought him in because he has a very different perspective and. And in this conversation, I think this is this is a great example. He's on the West Coast. Um, you and I um, have experience on the East Coast, and 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 we're both now here in Central Canada. So things are different throughout out the country. Um, do you know of specific best practices out there that you would recommend institutions embrace? You know, I don't have enough research to tell you that. So um, let me first start with that answer. But I'll tell you, I've been at four universities, and two of them have done it really well. When I went to Ryerson, the president, Sheldon Levy, brought from his office his, his, one of his special projects people, like big time person that he trusted the most. And he, that person was entrusted with making sure that I was connected to the university. Her name was Val Fox, and we would meet every Friday. And she was my safety net. Um, and she helped me... Um, it, it, I'll say it like this way. She was my guide and my mentor. How do you do this? Leah, hey, I'm having a problem. How's you, what do you think? And I could, I could bounce ideas off her. I've just started at Laurier and the president has already given me a resource um, to be like right from their office to be my main person to make sure that here are the people in the city that you need to meet. Here are the key um, leaders and alumni influencers. Okay, here's the key people on the, on the campus. Okay, let, let's talk about how the president thinks and interacts so that you know when she says this, she really means that. 
Oh, if you were going to do this, this wouldn't go well. That's not the Laurier culture way. Those are really key and critical things. So rather than picking a university that does it really well, I'll say the number one thing I think you can do is to put a guide, a mentor, um, a wise guru, whatever word you want to use, with that new person that's coming on board so that they have a lifeline to the institution that can help guide them. So I've seen a lot of your work reflect that. And um, I, I actually, I, I, I like dubbing you as, as the motivator in chief because you're, you're very good at presenting uh, issues and very positively offering uh, solutions to, to very difficult uh, situations and, and, and issues. Um, looking at universities and, and, and colleges, the post-secondary sector as a whole, why is it so difficult for black leaders to be accepted. And in fact, let, let's not even look at the post-secondary uh, system alone. Let's look at the corporate world, the larger world. Why is it so difficult for people to, to accept us? And, and by extension, you working with, with students, you know, have you seen it affect tomorrow's leaders? And what is it? What, what do you say and what can we do about those young people who um, are looking to lead tomorrow. 100%. So I think it's tough for black leaders to be accepted because, and I'll just speak for myself, um, you know, I'm a very direct communicator. There are cultural differences to how we communicate. We know that for a fact. Um, you know, if I was of Jamaican descent, you know, and I'll push a broad stereotypical brush, lots of people are afraid of Jamaican men uh, because they're talking loud, they're emoting a lot, they're doing all these sorts of things, and people think that, oh my gosh, what's going on, what's angry, and they stand off, and they feel like that. It's a fact that Caribbean people, by their nature, are very direct. Caribbean people make fun and poke fun. These are, they, those, those are things that are these, these cultural pieces that are happening in their family. And I'll say it for, you know, I, I, I see it in my parents, I see it in my relatives, about how the mannerisms that I have have been culturally passed on. And so when I'm sitting there and I'm looking and I'm listening, here's how I look and I listen. And all of a sudden people see that eyebrow and that scrawl and that bald head and say, he's intimidating. I don't want to stand with him. I don't want to talk with him. I don't want to, I don't want to be there. And so therefore, just that very presence of being who we are allows this gap to happen because people are filling that interpretation with their own story. And so this is really critical because then what happens is now they're alienated and because they're alienated, they don't want to stay in the institution. So I've just left an institution where I didn't feel like I mattered or I belonged or I was included. And so now when I was there every Friday night, I would have 50 to 80 black students at my house for wing night. And what happened is one of those students would pick, call up, pick me up. It's like, Dr. Joseph, I'm having trouble I got a problem with my engineering. I'm going to get kicked out. I don't know what to do. Okay, here's what you need to do. Dr. Joseph, can you help me? I, need, I don't have an internship. Da, da, da. Okay, here's what you do. Hey, Dr. Joseph, I was over at your house and I saw this big conch. Can I borrow that for my presentation? And so when we leave, those connections for the students leave. When we leave, the role model and aspiration and dreaming who they could be, that leaves. And that is a, is a shame. Because black students need black role models and mentors because it's easier for them to connect. If we can't see it, they can't achieve it. Representation matters. Yeah, Ivan, I'm, I'm sorry you, you, you had to experience that. And um, uh, unfortunately, that university has a, a history of, um, of, of uh, um, hiring uh, inequalities. And, and, and we know that they just apologized uh, last year for 200 years of systemic racism uh, on, on campus. Um, one of the things that, that also makes me ponder, and I'd, I'd like to ask you, my, my late father told me once that uh, he said, son, you can, you can be anything that, that you want to be. And um, as a young child with all kinds of ideals, I, I really took that to heart. Um, in my age, I'm, I'm finding that that might not necessarily be exactly the way that um, I had hoped that it would be. What do you think? Um, do you think that in 2020, black kids can actually be who they want to be professionally one day? Or do you think that there's still barriers in place that, uh, that affected us 50 years ago? No, I don't, I don't think so, Daniel. I, I, I don't think that... Um 
that we've gone back 50 or 100 years. Um, I do think that it's harder for us to be anything we want, that um, our path is not as easy and is not as smooth. There's not as many doors open. And sometimes we have to kick those doors down. But I'm going to choose hope and optimism, um, that there's many allies out there and there are many opportunities still there. Um, there's biases. Um, there are systemic barriers. Um, but we can still achieve it. Um, and it doesn't mean we don't have to work twice as hard. It doesn't mean we don't have more rejections. It doesn't mean that we don't have to be more qualified. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't get there. Okay. I was, I was hoping you would say that. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of people in the world who who just want to want to give up because they feel that they do not represent uh, what society at large uh, is. And and by with you saying that, um, the message is is very clear. It is keep working hard, don't give up, keep knocking on doors because at some point at some point uh, a door will open and it will be that right one. Let's talk a little bit more about you, Al, and you personally. You seem to be one of those people who is eternally positive. Uh, you give great advice to other people. But when you look at racism, you know, it's uh, that's something that's that's deeply per personal. It's very very painful and and can be very destructive to the mind, spirit and and body. How do you remain so focused? How do you remain hopeful? And and what's your secret to resilience? Well, there's a couple of things, right? Number 1, um I'm hardwired in, in, in my system, in my DNA to prove people wrong. It's, it's what makes me a national championship coach. It's why I pursue athletics at the highest level is I love being the underdog and I, and I revel in proving people wrong. When somebody, when I was a coach and somebody did not choose my university um, and they went someplace else, I, I, I didn't want to just beat them. I wanted to beat them nine, 10, 12, nothing um, to prove them to them wrong. You know, they're, I now leave this where I'm at because I want to go to my next institution and be so excellent. People are like, damn it, look what we had. This, this guy was amazing. And so I can't look and perseverate on, on, the, on the interpretation and the perceptions somebody has of me. I now need to say I'm going to channel that anger and that frustration and I'm going to be excellent at what I do and where I go. That people will look back and say, damn, I made a mistake. And that's really, I mean, it's, it's selfish of me. It's, it's, it's vengeful. It's egotistical, but I don't want to hurt them in terms of like, I'm going to beat you up. I want to hurt them in the sense of you had me and you let me go. Look how good I am. That's deep. That's, that's inspiring. Thank you. So, so I bought your book, you got this. And in it, you quote Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. So Ivan, it's 2020. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. Racism, although it's being addressed, is arguably more difficult and more challenging to deal with this year. Humanity has spent a great deal of this year locked up and probably the three most common words that we've heard this year are, you're on mute. So tell us, what are your words to keep us going? Even though it's 2020 and people want, will probably want to forget this year, what are your words of wisdom to us to stay positive? Well, I'll say this. Um, every experience that we go through, if you, if, if you reflect on it and say, what am I here to learn? If you look at every failure that you've had, there's been some lesson that you've been able to take from it, which has prepared you for your next opportunity. I know for a fact I would not have gotten a Laurier job if I did not have these two years at Dalhousie. And so sometimes we need to remind ourselves that just because something isn't delightful doesn't mean it hasn't been invaluable. And so for number one is you have to look and say, where do you want to be five years from now? Do not sit in year one here at, year, at, at 2020 and believe that this is defining your journey. This is one part of your journey. Where do you want to be five years from now? And what piece can you take from this rough and tumble year that have made you more resilient? You cannot achieve grit if you have not failed 
and persisted. And we know for a fact that the number one thing that achieves um, or helps people achieve success, that separates the people who are not high performers, is this whole thing called the skill of grit. And if there's anything that 2020 is teaching us and helping us develop, it's grit. And so stand back and recognize the learning that's happening to you and around you. Embrace it and recognize how it's preparing you for your next opportunity three years, five years from now. Because I want you to be strategic. I don't want you to be thinking about today or even tomorrow. I want you to think about a year from now, three years from now, five years from now. Because if you have that big picture, then you recognize how small this little window is really. What in your mind is the digital space going to look like in three to five years from now? Nobody knows that answer, right? And that's the thing. If you had said somebody a year ago that 99% of universities will be 98% online, I'm making those numbers up, nobody would have said, no way. They would have asked, I did not see that coming. And so rather than me play Nostradamus, I will say this, the digital landscape will be forever changed. Zoom isn't the future, Zoom is the present. What role will artificial intelligence play in our education? What role will micro-credential play? Will we go back to traditional brick and mortar universities? I doubt it. We're already hearing the conversation that the office space and the work environment is changing. And so I don't have the answer for you there, Daniel, except in this way, that the way we did education will no longer be the way we continue. There have been some things that we have learned through this pandemic accidentally, as well as on purpose, that will stick and will continue to transform education for everybody. We're asking for calls to action at TESS and um, looking at the theme of this conference, humanizing learning. What do you think faculty, staff and students can do to action more diversity and inclusion into learning? This is a really great question. You know, I, and I'll answer it this way. I was watching a Netflix special on barbecuing the other day, and I was just blown away at how they came and brought diversity into a barbecue cook-off competition show, which you would never think about. And hats off to these leaders. So typical, you know, you had eight people, seven people, six people, all this sort of stuff, and you'd get different challenges. Challenges. One of the challenges they did for the barbecue cook-off was, okay, now you have to use indigenous ways of cooking. What? I'm like, I love it. And then the next one they did is, okay, now it's international barbecue. We're going to assign your country. You have to do Moroccan, you have to do Japanese, and you have to do Argentinian. We don't think about diversity um, in creative ways. We think about diversity as I must hire a black person, I must hire a brown person, I must hire a woman. I want us to think about how can we make small steps to decolonize the curriculum, to show that there are other ways of knowledge, to show that there are other avenues to teach the same curriculum and knowledge content. If we do those sorts of things, we will open up people's eyes. And it could be something as simple as changing your guest speaker um, rotation so that the people look different that are coming in. Or if you've got just the one level of history, is there another way you can teach that content in some way, shape, or form? Diversity doesn't have to be these big, giant, grand, sweeping natures, um, um, exercises. Simple things will make a huge, profound difference in changing somebody's paradigm about what the cultural norms are. Dr. Ivan Joseph, it's been an honor to have you participate in TESS and take time out of your very busy schedule to speak with us. Um, on behalf of everybody at eCampus Ontario, we welcome you back to uh, Southwestern Ontario and look forward to having more conversations in the future. I know you're in uh, Nova Scotia for just a few more days, so you know, finish packing up that U-Haul and get over here. We'll see you again. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on and all the best with your conference. And there you have it, another fireside chat at TESS. Thanks so much for watching.